Today we have the info session about the call for education activities of CIVIS. And a bit about the structure, we will have uh, three presentations today. Uh, one about the call uh, and its components, as you can also find them on the CIVIS website. Uh, some information about the application form and uh, those components that are very important for the academics interested to submit proposals. And of course, a presentation about the evaluation criteria uh, and the, con the co concepts that are behind the evaluation and what it's important to consider for such proposals. Before I head into the first presentation, I would like to put some uh, faces to the names or names to the faces uh, of some of the colleagues that are present here and that are relevant for not only for the application, but for what will mean as support and help uh, for a long, for a long, uh, longer time. So um, my name is Alexandru Cartis. Uh, I am the head of the Civis Education Unit. And I'm really glad to be here and together with us, uh, I'll start with the other colleagues, heads of units. We have uh, David Tuzo, the head of the Digital Campus Unit, which you can see uh, connected and he will also present. Then we have uh, our colleagues, uh, Petra Hofner from uh, Salzburg and Lars Banza from Tübingen University, the, the heads of the mobility unit. Uh, and uh, I think we have also the colleagues from the communication unit, yet I don't see them yet here. And then we have our colleagues, the civics officers, uh, and we have uh, Anna Karim Björling from Stockholm University, our quality officer from civics, Christian Müllmann from Tübingen University, our global officer, um, and Enrique Martin Santa Maria, our innovative pedagogies officer, which of course we also have the presentation of the evaluation criteria. And then we have also some colleagues from VPs. We have uh, from Stream 2, we have George Hausenberger from University of Tübingen. Uh, we have from VP9, Maria Dascolia, the head of the VP9. Uh, VP10, we have, uh, I saw Stefano D'Amelio from VP10 and from VP11, we have uh, Alejandra and Nadia from Madrid. Uh, so these are some faces that you need to associate with some bodies in civics that will be very important. We have also some institutional coordinators with us, but I would not enter into too many details in presentation. Uh, so just to head directly into the topic. Uh, so the first part is a, a short presentation about the call itself, the typologies, the background, the application, the calendar, some information that are really important for, for us to clarify. So why this call? Of course, this call is very important for civics because it, it aims to expand the educational portfolio of the Alliance. The Alliance having a very important strategic objective to develop innovative, really nice, interesting, attractive uh, educational offers at all levels. And of course, to foster cooperation between the civics universities, so academics, researchers, staffs, uh, from, from all the civics universities to work together on such wonderful educational projects, align them, of course, with the educational expectations at European level, uh, such as the European degree framework, for example, and we'll talk that also uh, in the bachelor degrees, but also other aspects that are very important at European level, but also, of course, to enhance uh, educational innovation across all those typologies, uh, in, especially in teaching and learning practices, and of course, with a high focus on inter and transdisciplinarity, civic engagement, and all those global cooperation and societal impact. Now, who can participate in the call? Well, the, you know, you may have heard those that are more connected with civics or new to civics that we always have this uh, minimum three uh, rule, which is the golden rule of cooperation of civics, if I could call it like that, in the sense that, well, we expect that proposals come from a cooperation of at least three civics universities where, of course, African partners are more than invited to join those initiatives and to be part of these initiatives, but, of course, they are not counted towards the minimum three, as it is starting from the civics universities, the European one, uh, so to say, not the European Union one, but European one uh, as a continent. Uh, now, who do we address, so who can apply uh, concretely? Well, civics academics, uh, faculty members, employees with long-term contracts from any civics university. This is very important. And you see on the next bullet point, the fact that especially for, for very engaging educational activities, it's important that those academics are in a contractual relationship with the university well beyond the funding period, which is in its first phase until 2026. 
uh, as, as, I can, as I said, the African partner universities and, and members of the African partner universities are highly invited and welcome in this, this project. So we, we really encourage you to explore this cooperation, which is very important for civis and to, of course, consider adding such partners in your project proposal. Now, what are the steps that you have to consider in order to apply? Well, the first step is, of course, a consultative one in which we really advise you to discuss, have a good discussion inside your university, with your faculty, with your department, especially, in order to set those, well, premises for the educational activities you are proposing, but also with the civis representative, the institutional coordinator, the civis institutional coordinator you have in your university, the civis office, in order to make sure that those proposals comply with the regulations, with the practices, and with the guidelines that are in place. Now, of course, the second step is to form your, your, your well, uh, the, the consortium, the partnership, to identify the partners. And here, of course, if you have struggles identifying partner, your institutional coordinators are there to help you to identify partners. And of course, CVS has a lot of networks and, uh, well, a, a lot of ways to help you to find relevant partners that would work together with you to propose such, such actions. And it's important to clarify the roles from the very beginning, to know exactly who does what in that consortium in order that the discussions and the design are even easier along the way. Of course, then we invite you to submit your application through the civis application uh, system, the platform that we have, and our colleague David will present you also the application form uh, so that you can familiarize with that. And of course, the projects will then enter in an evaluation a procedure with, which of course, uh, has two steps, a technical evaluation, which is about eligibility, feasibility, the, the connection between the application and the civic objectives and European objectives as a whole, but also an academic, a scientific evaluation, which is more content-based. And that, that, of course, will be made by experts in that specific topic in order to make sure that, well, also the content and the objectives and the outcomes are innovative, attractive, and relevant for the audience. And then, of course, the applications that are selected as, as good for civis will be uh, approved by the civis steering committee, which is a governance body, and will be, of course, announced that they will be selected and supported by the alliance at all levels. And then, of course, follow the implementation and the follow-up. So along the way, of course, civis is there to help you. We will discuss about that with different bodies, different people that are there to support you, along, of course, also the financial support that is, is there. But it's not only that. Of course, you have human support, uh, which is also extremely important. But of course, you will have, of course, to submit different uh, well, uh, reports here and now, and of course, to submit to the feedback and guidance of the Alliance uh, at different steps. Now, the general calendar of the call, the call open, as you know, in July 2024, so this summer, and the submission deadline is uh, uh, well, a little a little bit more than a month from now in October 20. The evaluation period is expected to be on October and November, you know, November in order that we expect that the projects to start their work in designing and implementing from January next year. Of course, the implementation calendar for each type of activity will differ as we have different types of activities and of course, different well time spans needed for each of them. Now, what we actually talk about of educational typology, so what activities we are actually expecting you to consider to apply. So you can see here all the, uh, the actions that are included in the call. So firstly, we have the single learning activities, which are, let's say, the smaller scale activities, uh, which uh, you see there are four typologies here. The online courses, only asynchronous, very important for you to, to keep this in mind. Massive open online courses, the traditional MOOCs, uh, webinars and workshops. All of them, all four of them, are only for online learning environments. So no physical mobility, no face-to-face -face learning activities included in those four categories. And then we move to the three other categories, which are the bachelor degree programs, micro-credentials, and collaborative online international learning, or very simply put, COILs, as they are known in the literature as well. And of course, in the case of the degree programs, it's clear that we will also include physical mobility, but we'll talk about that afterwards, whereas the other two are, again, online learning activities. 
So starting with the single learning activities, as I said, there are four typologies. So the online courses asynchronous is an educational offer developed by the, by the universities, at least in a partnership, which is open to civis students and is delivered in an asynchronous, so a self-paced format or on a calendar programmed uh, span of activities, which are either embedded in the curriculum or are offered as a standalone uh, extracurricular option, focusing on, of course, developing different types of skills uh, with flexible, as I said, formats such as self-paced learning. Now, the difference now moving to the MOOCs, because of course, the first question that I, we are sure you are asking, okay, but what's the difference with the mm -hmm. MOOCs, of course? Uh, well, the main difference with the MOOCs is, of course, primarily the audience. The MOOCs are, of course, open to a global audience and not only civic audience, not only civic students. Uh, of course, in this case, we speak about, uh, we don't speak about ECTS recognition, for example, and transferability, uh, but we also speak about other types of, of way to organize the learning, such as, well, videos and other learning resources that provide this wide educational experience. Webinars, of course, you're very familiar with them, so it's not uh, new science we are bringing here, is those, you know, those interactive online seminars that engage participants in real-time discussions and in collaborations, which can also be recorded and used as asynchronous learning materials later or in another project. And workshops, again, online workshops, so no face-to-face -face workshops for this, at least for this round, uh, which is well more hands-on, more practical approaches in order to develop professional skills, technical skills, and of course, to encourage problem solving among participants. So why, why we should consider single learning activities? Well, of course, they're very flexible, allow different formats as we have seen, allow you to be quite inventive, quite flexible in how you develop your learning experience for the students. Uh, and of course, they are targeted toward very specific skills because they're short, they're very specific. And for example, MOOCs and webinars have a very high, nice global reach. So you can address to a really wide audience uh, outside civis. Of course, it's important that we use those contexts to experiment with new innovative teaching methods, uh, also digital tools, blended learning and other things. Uh, but also address civic engagement, societal impact, allowing the students to connect with real world issues. And also of course, to enhance career relevant skills, for example, for different types of students and audiences. Now moving to micro-credentials, which of course, you know, is like, is the hot topic of European educational development in the past uh, four and a half, five years, uh, which are, of course, very structured, short, flexible learning activities that provide certification for specific skills, knowledge, and competencies. So the focus moves a lot on the development of very specific competencies and skills, which are linked to a qualification and are very, of course, certifiable and subjected to quality assurance. So they are quite different from this point of view than uh, a, let's say, a single course, which is uh, more or less uh, delivered at university level. And of course, they can be either standalone qualifications or part of a larger degree, so leading to a higher educational activity. Now, they combine, they can combine different single learning activities. So micro-credentials basically should not be understood only as a course. They are basically a variety of learning environments that are put together in order to address those specific set of skills and competences. And of course, they are considered in a modular stackable way of learning. So they are based on this modular approach where learning is divided into independent structures that are interconnected. And they are designed both for traditional students, so for the students, either undergraduate or postgraduate students, but also for non-traditional students, meaning especially lifelong learners, which can be addressed through those micro-credentials. So this is the typology in the call that can also be addressed to lifelong learners. So why consider them? Of course, they're very flexible, they're very personalized, they're very customized, they're quite attractive, uh, very easy to say, and the fact that they lead to recognized qualifications. So they bring an added value also for the career development, for the labor market, and of course, they have a global recognition since they are aligned with European and national frameworks, uh, also enhancing uh, recognition of learning and mobility of learning. They have to be very 
well connected with the labor market demands because they are highly aligned with the labor market expectations. They have to address civic and societal engagement. And of course, they have to have a transdisciplinary approach. They are not only very you know, disciplinary based because we expect very innovative, a very interesting way to combine those disciplines in a nice way of complex learning environments. Collaborative online international learning coils are the experience of connecting together learning communities from different courses of different universities in an online digital environment where students and academics work together to address really nice project-based learning activities and explore new ways of, of learning. So they facilitate global learning intercultural competencies because they bring basically together those people in an online environment. So students and, and staff and academics from faculties department from different countries work together in those joint projects, discussions inside the existing courses. And of course, they are they can be integrated also as standalone modules in the future. If the cooperation works, if everything functions well, they can even be explored to be transformed into independent modules which can even include guest lectures, group projects, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, and many, many other really nice activities. And they use digital environments for synchronous and asynchronous interaction between learners, between students, uh, in order to address the participation of different types of learners, including a higher inclusion rate, also with accessibility principles, and even from different time zones. This is a, a graphical way to see what we actually mean. So we have a course at University 1 and another course at University B, either in the same language or why not in different languages, uh, so, well, as service also explores multilingualism practices and the uh, learning of new languages, either in the same discipline or in a different one which is connected or can be used in an interdisciplinary approach. Now, once they are connected, basically the students, the primarily the academics work together to design a window of four, eight weeks, depending on the, on the design, where students engage together, work together, peer to peer on projects and activities and discussions in order to explore really interesting topics related to the courses. And then, of course, at the end of the activity, they return back in the learning environment in their own courses and finalize the course at their own university. So there's no credit transfer between the students, but students receive their own credits at their own university. Now, why we should consider COILs? Well, it's clear that it's very interesting for the students because it's a, it's a rather, let's say, cost-effective, a nice cost-effective alternative to physical mobility, where students can easily engage together and work on project-based activities together with their academics for a specific time range in the courses. They provide intercultural competencies, and of course, they connect with their peers from other, from other universities. Now, of course, it's important to consider interdisciplinary learning experiences, bringing together those competencies together, but also, of course, civic engagement, global challenges, and the pedagogical innovation. Now, moving to the, the uh, bigger part of the, of the typology and the last one. I hope I didn't bore you yet. Uh, so the joint degree programs, the bachelor degree programs. So. To start with the definition, I didn't put an official one. I put a customized one for the purpose of, of this, this meeting. So when we speak about joint degree programs, we speak about degree programs, in this case, bachelor degree programs, which are collaboratively developed and offered by multiple universities with students completing parts of their studies at different institutions and receiving a single or multiple diplomas upon graduations. And I highlight this because we can, of course, explore the potential of mixed degree combinations depending on the regulations at hand. Uh, but of course, the expectation is that there is at least one joint degree awarded by at least two of the universities inside the consortium. Now, of course, the, the objective is to promote interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary and cross-border cooperation, and of course, to align 
the degrees with the European degree criteria as announced by the European Commission, and you have them in the core document referenced there. The outcome. So we expect two types of proposals for the bachelor degrees, either new proposals, so programs that don't exist yet in the offering of the university, but that could be developed between the partnership of different civics universities into a joint bachelor program with the award of joint uh, uh, degrees or joint and multiple degrees, or the redevelopment of existing bachelor degrees that are interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. So existing bachelor programs that the consortium identifies as really nice, attractive, that can be transformed, meaning not only adding new partners, because that's not enough, but actually changing the way the program is designed, both in terms of curriculum, content, the jointness of the cooperation, the jointness of the admission, and many other aspects that really show a joint program to be awarded. So the program has to include at least one transdisciplinary module that integrates insights from multiple disciplines and the module can be seamlessly integrated into existing degree programs or developed as a standalone module. You know, so we, we can explore multiple options for these approaches. Not all the civics universities that are part of the consortium have to award the degree. So you can consider consortium with, for example, three universities that award a degree and two others that support teaching, for example, experiences and, 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 other, and other approaches. Uh, but, of course, we really address the fact that at least three of the universities, three of the universities award the degree. So universities that don't award a degree can also contribute, as I said, with co-teaching, offering modules, extracurricular activities, summer school seminar, internships, and other activities as well. So the expectation is that the bachelor has a modular design. So we don't speak about very standard bachelor degrees, uh, very linear ones. Of course, we want to break the boundaries and to go a, a bit more than we are used to do in a, in a non-alliance framework. Uh, aligning, the, of course, the program with, as I said, the European degree criteria uh, launched by the European Commission and to incorporate existing educational formats, such as, for example, BIPs, online courses, joint seminars, summer schools, as I said, or other, other actions. Uh, the target date for that, and this is really important, that we need at least to have a consortium agreement between the participation university by September 2026 in order to prove the existing of the program by the end of the funding period of the European Commission, especially for the newly developed one. For the really developed bachelor program, it will depend, of course, on the nat nature of the program itself. For that, of course, we ask the applications that they submit a clear timeline of the programs of development. Of course, there may be a lot of open questions. There may be a lot of questions or uncertainties about the accreditation, for example, or other aspects that don't allow the academics to know exactly all the challenges that they may face, but at least they show us that there is a clear view of how they want to develop the bachelor degree in the future. And of course, it's very important that the bachelor degrees and the applications, the proposals, provide a clear anal analysis of the degree's added value for job market integration, and of course, highlighting its competitive advantage, because this is really important for the Alliance to know, okay, why would I prefer this bachelor over the other? And why is that competitive enough for civis in comparison with the other alliances? Now, of course, the, the added value of it is it's quite clear. Of course, it, it allows students to gain multiple experiences in multiple civis institutions. And of course, it has a high impact in the society. A joint bachelor degree is really visible, attractive, and very competitive in the international educational market. Uh, so that means that we need to incorporate those flexible modular designs 
we need to consider extracurricular activities such as internships, for example, which can provide the students practical learning experiences along their academic learning, but also the proposal should think about, okay, what happens after the funding? So how do we sustain those projects? Because of course, a bachelor degree is really, well, it's more challenging, of course, to sustain for a long run. Of course, we are here to help. So even though I, I say all this, please consider everything with the background that we are here to help. So shortly on the funding, because this is quite straightforward also in the call document, so I would not insist on that, but you have the maximum amounts per project that can be awarded. So please take this with a pinch of salt in the sense that if your project is considered eligible, it doesn't mean that you will receive automatically this amount. You may receive less based on the evaluation or based on the decision of service on different needs. And this is really important, but you have them there and you have them also on the website. I will not insist on that. And you also have, of course, the eligibility and ineligibility of costs also in the call document. So the eligible costs are about staff cost, not for teaching, but only for supporting the staff to work towards the creation and implementation of the program. Mobility cost for meetings in order to advance with the design and implementation of the program for both administrative and academic staff. And of course, development of course materials, digital tools, content, so everything that supports innovating the learning there. And of course, our colleagues, for example, from the innovative pedagogies areas are even more there to support you with that area and also to well, identify the best use of how such materials can be uh, created. Uh, no subcontracting is allowed. So everything has to be conducted uh, with direct funding. No equipment can be purchase, purchased from this money. This is really important. And also consider that there may, may be some additional uh, restriction that apply to local universities. And for that, once we have also the application, or even when you think about the funding that you have to submit with your proposal, you can consult, of course, your institutional coordinator. They can provide you more information about the funding and the restrictions that can apply. So some closing regards before giving the, the microphone to my colleagues. As I said, CIVIS is here to support. We have the different structures, different bodies, different persons that are here to support uh, you along the way before submission, after submission, upon implementation, and so on. So network building from the very first, uh, first phase, support and organization, logistics, branding, templates, promotion, uh, administrative issues, such as the educational issues of recognition, accreditation, mobility aspects, uh, and everything that is needed, of course, also support towards the, the digital environment, innovative teaching approaches, and other types of support, uh, and I didn't want to list everything here. Then you will have access to the presentations, also mine and my colleagues. Afterwards, you have the links here, of course, uh, and you have also the additional information uh, on the website. Now close my share screen. And uh, as I said, the Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation. So please keep your questions until then. Uh, and now I would give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, David Tuzo to present you uh, some information about the application form and, and the platform. David, please. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'll just share a few things. So my role for today uh, is to try to help you um, how to apply. Um, so maybe I... Some of you are already used it for the um, call for project in CIS. We still use the same platform. Uh, but one thing that you, you have to know, uh, uh, it's uh, it's important and you will see it on the website. We we have two different application forms, one for the bachelor, and you will have, uh, have the link, and one for uh, all the SLAs, micro credential and COIL. The reason is quite simple. The information we need for bachelor is 
really, it's really different from the one for the other activity. So it was uh, more simple to, to really create two different application form. Um, one thing that you can know also uh, is uh, it's possible uh, to apply uh, for different kind of activities, meaning if you, know, you want to participate in a bachelor application, uh, but also uh, in micro-credential, it's possible, of course, to apply to, to both. Um, so how uh, it looks like uh, you have this, uh, you, you, you will come to this platform where you can see uh, the, the text of the code and a button to apply. And then you will have different steps to follow. The first one is to find, to provide some uh, information about the applicant. The applicant is the one that will submit the proposal. It's most of the time the coordinator uh, or the, the academics from the coordinating university. And then you will have a second step to provide all the information about the project um with some uh, be, uh take attention to some links that you where you need to download some documents that i will present you just after that uh, and you will need to upload this document where with all the relevant information in terms of document so um basically uh in this application form tool, what is interesting is you can start, you can see uh, the information that are requested, you can start filling uh, and come back later. So every information you start to fill will be uh, stored. So it's possible to start uh, your application, come back when you have more detail to provide. Uh, be careful at the very bottom of the, this page to uh, to uh, mark as submitted. So so really your application will be submitted on time. Regarding the different documents that will be asked uh, during this application process, uh, there's a letter of intent and commitment. Uh, the letter of commitment is for the bachelor because the bachelor need a real uh, engagement of the universities that will coordinate this bachelor program. So you will see this document is uh, very important and need to be signed by your service office, by the project coordinator and the faculty department that will um, uh, have this uh, bachelor program uh, inside. Uh, regarding the other activities, SLA micro-credential and code, uh, you uh, need to provide a letter of intent uh, for the civic educational uh, activities that will need to be signed by the civic office of your university. It's for the coordinating university only. But it's still very important. So it was mentioned several times already by Alexandru. Um, being in contact with your civic office since the beginning is uh, very important to, to, to have this document signed. Uh, and, and so mainly they know and they can support you doing all this process. The other important things, and Alex mentioned uh, the, the different information about the budget per activity and um, the eligible cost. So uh, as it was mentioned during this presentation, you, uh, you will have this budget template that you can download. Um, and with the three categories that was mentioned, staff cost, where you can say a professor or a support member from one of the departments that can um, that will work on this project, uh, the amount that will be uh, that you you and and the team coordinating this project will uh, um, give to the different people participating. Uh, and you need to provide the name of the course that they will uh, provide um, and some detail about what they will uh, do uh, regarding this course. Um, there's also this possibility to have some mobility expense uh, where you will need to detail uh, the name of the professor, uh, the university where he comes from and the university where he will go. Um, and uh, the amount uh, uh, that will come uh, with that. And there's also the possibility to uh, have some other expenses that are neither um, staff or mobility. Uh, I try to, uh, to add an example. If you need to rent a room uh, for uh, um, 
preparing a video um, for, for, for your micro credential, for example. Um, of course, uh, it's a European budget, so um, all um, mobility uh, to Glasgow or Lausanne can be funded by um, the European uh, Union funds and Series 2 funds. Uh, the same for um, the staff cost and the other expenses. Uh, it, it, it can be with European fund uh, Glasgow and Lausanne, but still be in contact if uh, it's the case with uh, the institutional coordinator of these two universities. They may, be, um, they may find uh, some other support that they could bring um, in that case. Um, and just three final comments. Um, all the documents, templates, presentation, uh, you will find the link. I will put it on the chat uh, if you need. Um, for more support on the call, especially on the technical issue, but maybe also on question about the content of the call, you have a, an email that you can contact. And Again, ensure to consult and notify your CVC institutional coordinator and their team so uh, to, to add the support uh, of your university before submitting. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, dear David. Uh, so we will move to the third presentation made by our colleague Enrique Martin Santa Maria, our CVC Innovative Pedagogies Officer on the criteria. Enrique, please. Hello, everyone. Let me just share the screen in a good way. I think now it's better, right? Okay, so hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy also to see that so many, there are so many interested people in this call. As Alexandru said before, my name is Enrique Martin. I'm the Civis Innovative Pedagogies Officer. And my role here is to present uh, the evaluation process of the of the projects of the call. I'll try to be as as clear and simple as possible because most of the information is already written in the call. Some of it has been already mentioned by Alex. And anyway, we'll have the uh, question and answer sessions to to solve some doubts. So I mainly want to focus on three things. I want to explain how the process is going to be. Um, this is where I will start from. Um, based on the experience of the previous years, we decided that it's important to have this evaluation process divided into two different phases. One for what we can call the CVS criteria and the other for the scientific or the academic evaluation. This presentation will focus on the CVS criteria, the scientific evaluation. You, you know it, I will just make some comments on it. But the CVS criteria is mainly an attempt to translate the CVS strategic uh, objectives into educational content. So to speak. So there are some things that CVS as an, as an alliance aims at to. CVS that some things that CVS want to develop as a, an alliance of universities. What we've done here is to develop some um, criteria that encourage the development of educational activities that are coherent with these general objectives. So this criteria that we call CVS criteria will be firstly what will be the first criteria to be evaluated and will be evaluated by a, by a commission, by a group of people composed by people that have responsibilities in the civic functioning. Some of the people are here, some work package leaders, some officers concerned by these criteria, some head of units and so on. So people from the civic ecosystem who will be in charge of uh, making, of evaluating to what extent the proposals are coherent with the civic strategic objectives. Once this step has been done, there will be, of course, an academic evaluation that will be in charge of, uh, 
be of experts on the different domains depending on the on the academic proposal. So these two phases, but will be complementary. First, the series criteria in order to evaluate to what extent they're fitting this objective. Second, the academic one. Um, maybe well, the series criteria are the ones that are developed in the in the series website. You will see when you go into the series website uh, a link that sends you to a table where these subject with these criteria are developed. I just want to make uh, some clarifications to to try to delimit the the perimeter of these of these criteria. So, what are these criteria? As I said before, a way of translating these strategic priorities into concrete educational projects. When we say, for example, that we want to develop the partnerships with with African universities, what these criteria are meant to do is to evaluate to what extent the project is uh, encouraging the concrete uh, co-creation with uh, African partners. The same with transdisciplinarity and the same with inclusion and accessibility. Second, secondly, it's an attempt to facilitate projects evaluation by providing clear information. As you will see in the table, we try to be pretty simple in the presentation. Uh, we have five different axes, five different criteria, each of which is divided into four different columns, depending on the extent to which this criterion is met. This, will, this is supposed, we hope, hopefully, it will facilitate both the development of projects. So if you have this in mind, when you start working on a project, hopefully it will help you to address it in a way that is coherent with this strategic access. And secondly, we expect that they will help also us, this team, this commission, to evaluate in a more transparent way and a more in a clearer way uh, these projects. And then it's a step for further improvement in the sense that there will be things that are not so clear. There may be things that are not so clear, we are, because CIVIS is, a, is an innovative initiative as well, we are learning by doing as well. So it's a way of improving the way we will evaluate um, future calls uh, after this one. And what is not, and I think this is something important to, to say, it is not uh, a list in which is mandatory to meet all the criteria. Uh, the more they are met, the better, the better evaluated it will be. But it doesn't mean that if you have, uh, you are thinking of developing a project that fits four of these criteria, but you do not include, let's say, an African partner at all, it doesn't mean it won't be evaluated. So it's just a way to encourage you to go on these five directions. It's not a way of excluding projects just because one or two criteria have not been met. And of course, it's not a way of conditioning the academic content. We are talking here just about uh, formal criteria. We're trying to give a framework within which the projects will be developed academically. This commission will not enter at all in the academic or scientific uh, content. And third, uh, just to develop a little bit the the, the service criteria, as I said, we focused on five of them. The first is the external stakeholders, to what extent they are involved in the life cycle of the project. Uh, so mostly on three things. First, to what extent they're involved in the in the in the in the needs of the civil society. If they Let's say, I don't know, I'm just thinking loudly here, but let's say that they participate in the identification of a concrete challenge and that they work together with you academics on the design of the course from the beginning, from the identification of the need uh, to the end. So that would be a positive thing. The same for the course development. Are they somehow involved also 
in the in the course or in the program development or in the educational format development do they intervene with the students or not and finally are they also involved in the in the impact let's say do we have any way to measure to what extent let's say if if, if you're working with a with a with a local community to what extent the program has been beneficial to this community or not i we, we really we really know that some of these criteria are not always easy to be met some of them are just not applicable in your applicable in your your context and that's fine that's going to be also uh, evaluated with uh, common sense the african dimension which is something that uh, distinguishes civis from other initiatives and something in which uh, very much interest is put from a strategic point of view and we are trying to focus here on two things once one the number of partners involved which is something uh, we did already and also and again just when applicable the intercultural scope to what extent we deal with topics that could have uh, that could encourage the dialogue between different cultural contexts Third, the teaching and learning uh, components that are mainly focused on the pedagogical alignment. So to what extent it's coherent, the, the learning objectives, the, the activities or the format of the course and the evaluation of these activities to be coherent with the objectives identified. And then the student-centered dimension is there any way that the student is encouraged to participate, to have a, a central role in the in the course or the program and so on? Transdisciplinarity here, uh, as Alex said before, what we aim at doing is to, again, to encourage that you dialogue with other disciplines in the development of the initiative the more implicated the disciplines are the better we also know that the more we you try to do it the more complicated to do it the more innovative it is the less tradition we have on this so but that's why we also try to encourage innovation in this in this sense there are some things that we are learning by doing again but if if in, if you are really willing to develop something like this we just encourage you to express it in the, to explain it in the application, to explain your ideas on all, on all of these issues, at least to leave, to let us understand what's, what's behind uh, your proposal. And finally, <clears throat> uh, focus on inclusion and accessibility. And here we focus on two things, the multilingual component, as Alex said before, when talking about the goals, for example, and also the digital accessibility, most of the of the formats that are part of this call are supposed to be online. So again, if it's not mandatory to have uh, everything, it would be nice if you explore some ways to incorporate, to integrate students that do not have the same facilities to, to be part of a course, of a program, because of uh, accessibility uh, issues so that's on me i think alex i give you the floor maybe you can go to the question and and answer that thank you very much enrique and thank you very much also to david again for the presentation we really hope that this uh, these presentations were helpful for you to understand better understand the call and the parts of it of course they're not uh, exhaustive in all the areas. They most certainly don't reply to all of your questions now that you have or the future ones. But of course, before starting the Q&A session today, I would really like to uh, reaffirm the fact that whenever you have any questions, any doubts, even after the info session, please do not hesitate to contact us at the email address you have seen, you will find it also in the website but also you can contact us through the institutional coordinator and we are here to provide any support needed, any reply to the questions that you may have or any doubts you have when pre preparing your application uh, to be submitted. 